As much as I love talking about the history of evolution on this planet, I also love talking about the history of scientific discovery because it never fails to blow people's minds that we didn't just know everything all at once, but then it came in a really bizarre order. For example, did you know that we discovered the outer planets before we discovered bacteria? In 1610, Galileo built a telescope and looked up in the sky and saw Saturn and Jupiter. And it wasn't until 1676 that Leeuwenhoek built the first microscopes and tested pond water and the plaque on his teeth and saw the very first evidence of microorganisms, or as he called them at the time, animalcules. So we knew about the biggest things in our solar system before we knew about the smallest organisms on this planet. How cool is that to think about? The beautiful white doves that you see released at weddings and funerals and things like that usually aren't actually doves. They're homing pigeons or rock pigeons, which is fine. That's in the same family as doves. And the reason why they use those is that they can fly back to the company that released them. They can figure out which way is what and go back to their coop and, and be fed and then be used for the next show. But uh, that isn't always the case because there really aren't very good laws for the abandonment of domestic birds. So a lot of unscrupulous companies will just go buy some white ring neck doves for like 20 bucks a pop and release them. And then they just die out in the wild because they have no survival skills and you just release them into a totally new environment. So check to make sure that your dove releaser is reputable is, is the message of this video. Hey there, I'm extremely tired. Did you know? that giraffes didn't evolve in Africa. They evolved in Asia and then dispersed into Africa around 7 million years ago and just never left. They're basically invasive. They just set up shop in Africa around the same time that our ancestors were splitting with those of chimpanzees. And, and they just hung out there. Also, up until around 10,000 years ago, at the end of the last Ice Age, lions were one of the most widespread type of large mammals in the entire world. They had populations in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas. They were only second to humans. So if we were around, they would have been the most widespread type of large land mammal on the planet up until the end of the Ice Age. How freaking cool is evolution, dude? I love her. You just... God. So friendly. So friendly. I know it. You're so friendly. You're so friendly. Oh my god. Why are you doing it? What what do you have to gain? What's oh my gosh. Just I know it, bud. You're just you're all about it. There you go. Just dig into it. Get after it. Oh my. <laughs> What's your deal, bro? <laughs> Duh. This is an awesome question because oxygen plays a huge part in Earth's history. It plays a huge part in the history of evolution as well. And you're right. There weren't always trees and grass to produce this oxygen. So where did it come from? Well, I could just say that there are lots and lots and lots of other photosynthetic organisms that make oxygen. But I want to be clear. I'm not just talking about other plants. I'm talking about phytoplankton microorganisms that do photosynthesis. Green algae, coccolithophores, diatoms, cyanobacteria, like these things produce 80% of the oxygen today. 80% of the oxygen that you're breathing right now comes from phytoplankton, comes from tiny, tiny little microorganisms that do photosynthesis. Then they were around well before there were plants. They caused the first mass extinction on the planet. And green algae are the ancestors of land plants today. So again, huge part of our story. Thank you so much for asking. I am beyond stoked right now. I have been trying to record this video for days and I'm just vibrating because this is such an awesome story and I am so excited to tell it to you. So pull up a chair. We're going to talk about how these early photosynthetic microorganisms caused the first mass extinction on the planet. So the first thing you have to remember 
is that oxygen is insanely electronegative. It is so good at bonding to other atoms and making exciting new molecules. It's like its favorite thing to do. So you just don't find oxygen by itself out there in the universe. There are very, very few, very, very specific, very, very rare events that produce free oxygen. So the atmosphere of early Earth didn't have any oxygen in it, but it was rich in methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. So the Earth was very, very hot for a very, very long time. And so these early, early photosynthetic microorganisms are gobbling up all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because it's an abundant resource and they're making good use of it and they're pooping out oxygen. And that's totally fine because the Earth is a really big place and there's plenty of places to shove all of this new oxygen, right? For a while. Because eventually, around two and a half billion years ago, these microorganisms have so fundamentally changed the chemistry of our entire atmosphere that we start seeing huge ramifications. First and foremost being, the sky is now blue. That's where that comes from. That's when that started being a thing. And also, we see thick bands in the geological strata around this time of totally new minerals that weren't there before. Hematite, magnetite, oxides. The whole earth rusts under the weight of all of this new oxygen. And the oxygen starts reacting with all the methane in the atmosphere, producing more carbon dioxide, which is still a greenhouse gas, but not nearly as strong of one, which plunges the earth into a series of ice ages that last for over a billion years. And this is what causes the mass extinction, is that all of these microorganisms are either going to freeze to death, or they're going to die in a planet that is bathed in their own waste. And the only thing that pulls us out of this situation is that animals evolve. At the very latest, around 600 million years ago, at the very earliest, around 900 million years ago, the modern genetic evidence is kind of pushing it back and back further and further. So we're not 100% on this, but in this time period, animals evolve. And then about 540 million years ago, you get the Cambrian explosion. Life gets real weird real fast. And this is where we get this beautiful, intricate dance that we have today of oxygen usage from animals and then photosynthesis. Notice I say photosynthesis, not plants, because actual true plants evolve after animals, but animals evolved after photosynthesis. And it's also a tale about climate change, because if microorganisms can fuck up the earth, so can we. And that is the tale of the great oxygen catastrophe. This comment was left on my video about how we've observed homosexual behavior in over 1,500 different animal species. And this person says that that still makes it unnatural, because the only purpose for sex is procreation. And that is simply not true. Just like with homosexuality, we have observed deliberately non-reproductive sex purely for the purpose of pleasure in a lot of different species across the animal kingdom. Not all animals do it, but lots and lots and lots of animals do it. Deer do it, cats do it, dolphins do it, pigs do it, rhinoceroses do it, several species of primates, most notably humans do it, and that's just off the top of my head. And one of the reasons why we know that these animals are having sex for pleasure and not to procreate is because several of these species are what we call seasonal breeders, which means they're only actually able to get pregnant at one particular time of the year, and they are deliberately having sex outside of that breeding season. By the way, fun fact, the opposite of a seasonal breeder is a continuous breeder, and that is my least favorite way to describe humans ever. And another reason why we know these animals are deliberately having sex just for pleasure is because a lot of the behaviors that we see are behaviors that couldn't possibly result in procreation. Anal sex, oral sex, non-penetrative genital stimulation, which is the fancy biology way to say masturbation, we've seen it all in all sorts of animal species. And that's the cool thing about not being puritanical about sex, is that you very quickly realize that it's not scary, and it's nothing to be ashamed of, and most importantly, it's not unidimensional. It's actually very interesting. It's a diverse and fascinating field of study. So if you are just wanting to use sex for procreation, that's totally fine. If you are asexual, that's totally fine. You do you, you have fun. But if you're going to try to tell me that animals don't just have sex for pleasure and that they're only trying to procreate, the data just aren't on your side. And if you're going to sit here and try to convince me that it's immoral or unnatural to have sex just for fun, then I'm going to go find my fiancé and prove you wrong.